Hi and hello, this is Cole McCormick and you're watching one hour of Godzilla facts to fall asleep to. I don't normally make compilations like this, but what I did was I took a bunch of my YouTube shorts and I re-recorded them so that I'm talking slower so it's easier for you to fall asleep to. And then I just put some visuals up. Uh, they're somewhat minimal, so like I said, my videos aren't normally like this, but uh, yeah, feel free to check out the rest of my channel and uh, enjoy. Godzilla, originally known as Gojira in Japan, made its debut in the 1954 film of the same name. Inspired by nuclear fears following the events of World War II and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla symbolizes the destructive power of nuclear weapons and the consequences of nuclear testing. However, this symbolism has shifted in recent years. For example, in Shin Godzilla, connections can be drawn to the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster rather than the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It doesn't even have to be historical events either, as Godzilla Minus One has the monster represent survivor's guilt. Godzilla's size has varied throughout its cinematic history, ranging from approximately 50 meters tall, or 164 feet, to over 100 meters, or 328 feet. As of the recording of this video, the tallest version of Godzilla is Godzilla Earth from the Netflix anime trilogy, standing at around 300 meters, or almost 1,000 feet tall. Released in 1954, Gojira was a big hit in Japan and around the world. However, there were some scenes that didn't make it into the final cut. One scene that didn't make it was Godzilla holding a cow in his mouth when he first appears on Odo Island. While it was effective, according to crew members, it did cause an issue with scale. Godzilla is supposed to be 164 feet tall, and a cow is around 5 feet. How could a cow visibly appear in Godzilla's mouth? It just didn't make sense, so the filmmakers decided to cut the scene. Before the era of bonus features, film studios would destroy footage that didn't make it into the final film because they had no use for it. But there are still a couple of frames from the cow scene that did survive. Hopefully, someone at Toho Studios still has the original footage tucked away in their archives, but as of right now, it's unavailable to the public. In the music video for Number of the Beast by the metal band Iron Maiden, Godzilla can be seen several times through the use of stock footage. In March 1970, during the Children's Festival at the Osaka World Fair, Toho and Daie collaborated to create a special one-act stage show called Godzilla vs. Gamera. This show took place at the Expo's Festival Plaza venue and ran for a total of 10 days. Originally, Haru Nakajima was scheduled to perform as Godzilla three times a day, but due to the complexity of the event, the show times were reduced to once a night. The stage show featured several famous kaiju characters like Godzilla, Gorosaurus, Minya, Gamera, Space Gaios, and Jiger, all engaging in an epic battle for the audience to enjoy. Promotional images from the event do exist, as well as small video snippets. However, the entire performance was likely never filmed, and as a result, it's considered to be lost media. Chibiko Special, which translates to Small Child Special, was a Japanese stage show that aired on Tokyo 12 from October 24, 1971 to September 24, 1972. The exact producers of the show remain unknown, but it featured various Toho monsters and original kaiju. Godzilla himself appeared in the show alongside other famous monsters like Gabara, Gigan, Ghidorah, Kamanga, and Mothra. Some of the suits used for the original kaiju in Chibiko Special were later reused by Toho for their 1972 series Go Godman. One of the weirder inclusions to the special was a wholly original character named Mechani Godzilla, which was described by spectators as being a normal Godzilla suit that was painted chrome with various levers and buttons glued onto the suit. Only promotional pictures and a few behind the scenes images exist from the special none of which feature Mechani Godzilla. On March 15, 1977, NBC aired Godzilla vs. Megalon nationwide during primetime. For some reason, it was the only time a Japanese Godzilla movie got this special treatment. Because the movie had a reputation for being somewhat goofy, they filmed short segments with SNL actor John Belushi dressed up as Godzilla. 
Since these segments aired before home recording became common, it's unlikely that they were saved. They were only shown during the original broadcast and were rerun once or twice afterwards, but then disappeared forever. In a scene that didn't make it into the 2014 Godzilla movie, there's a moment where the film's protagonist, Ford Brody, talks to a Japanese immigration agent at the airport in Japan. The immigration agent is played by Akira Takarada, who was the main character in the original 1954 Godzilla film. Set photos made their rounds online of the film's director, Gareth Edwards, with Takarada. There's even a bootleg still frame from the scene that I found on Reddit. However, the scene was weirdly not included on the film's Blu-ray release and is considered to be lost media. In 2004, marking the 50th anniversary of Godzilla's cinematic debut, the King of the Monsters was honored with a star on the renowned Hollywood Walk of Fame. In the song Godzilla by Blue Oyster Cult, the band sings about the destructive power and fearsome nature of Godzilla, portraying the monster as a force to be reckoned with. The lyrics describe Godzilla's rampage through the city and the havoc that it wreaks, evoking the imagery of chaos and destruction associated with the creature. It's a classic rock song with a real funky bass lick that drives the entire track. When the band performs this song live, the lead singer, Buck Dharma, actually performs the spoken word bridge in Japanese. A lot of people like to credit Haru Nakajima as being the only actor that donned the Godzilla suit when filming the original 1954 movie, but this just isn't true. Katsumi Tezuka actually wore the suit too, but he rarely gets mentioned. A lot of this has to do with the fact that the majority of his scenes were cut from the final film due to the suit being very hard on his body. During the initial fitting of the suit, Nakajima actually experienced a mishap where he stumbled and fell. It's widely publicized that the Godzilla suit was essentially torture to wear. In 1992, Toho sold Sony Pictures the rights to an American Godzilla film. After the script was finished in 1994, director Jan DeBont was hired. Ricardo Delgado commissioned concept art for the American Godzilla, as well as an evil alien kaiju called the Griffin. Stan Winston Studios was even hired to work on the film, and they did movies like Terminator and Aliens. Eventually, the movie was reworked into the 1998 Godzilla film after some budgetary constraints and after DeBont left the project. Did you know that a group of rogue Toho employees made a Godzilla film in 1983? It was titled Legendary Beast Wolfman vs. Godzilla, and the plot followed a werewolf in Japan who becomes irradiated and grows to be as tall as Godzilla. From there, the two monsters begin fighting and wreaking havoc across the countryside. Fuyuki Shinada, who would later work on GMK, Giant Monsters All Out Attack, designed the monster suits, giving them a retro Showa-era feel with the Godzilla suit looking very similar to his design in King Kong vs. Godzilla. Wolfman vs. Godzilla was considered lost for decades, with some not even believing that the film was real and was nothing more than an urban legend. That was until 2012, when behind-the-scenes pictures were released. Earlier last year, 23 minutes of the film were posted to YouTube, but as of right now, the film is still being edited, and there's no telling when it's going to be actually released. In 1992, Nike, alongside Industrial Light and Magic, made a commercial titled Godzilla vs. Charles Barkley, where a kaiju-sized Charles Barkley challenges Godzilla to a basketball game. The Godzilla suit itself, while looking goofy, was made up of foam rubber pieces, and there were puppeteers in place that helped make the monster's facial expressions appear more goofy and comedic. Ironically enough, the crew actually took the miniatures made from Ghostbusters 2 and had them resemble Tokyo for the specific commercial. In 1993, Dark Horse Comics would put out a one-shot comic that was an adaptation of this commercial, where Charles Barkley actually challenges Godzilla to a basketball match. Several monsters monsters were set to appear in Godzilla Unleashed, but were ultimately cut for a variety of reasons. First up, we have Hedorah, who was scrapped because of issues with cell shading in her blob-like form, as well as the transformation being too complex to pull off on the Wii. Monster X was also scrapped for this very same reason. King Kong and Gamera were considered, but couldn't appear because of copyright issues. Clover from Cloverfield was also considered to show up as a playable fighter. Baggin nearly made the final cut, 
but was replaced by Varen. Zilla was also considered, but the devs believed that there would be a decent amount of fan backlash if the tuna head was included. In 1990, an advertisement appeared promoting various Toho games for the Nintendo Entertainment System, including Godzilla Monster of Monsters, Circus Caper, the Game Boy Godzilla game, Times of Lore, and a game titled Rodan. Nintendo Power Issue 16 briefly mentioned the game in their Game & Watch section, and noted that it was sort of a sequel to the NES Godzilla game. However, the Rodan NES game was eventually cancelled and later re-emerged as Godzilla 2 War of the Monsters. In 1963, Toho planned to make a movie titled Godzilla vs. Frankenstein. The plot would have followed Frankenstein, whose irradiated heart would cause him to grow into the size of a kaiju. Godzilla would then be freed from an iceberg by the Japanese military in order to fight the monster. However, Toho didn't like the idea of Godzilla being a good guy, so they had Mothra replace Frankenstein as Godzilla's next adversary, and the script would be reworked into Mothra vs. Godzilla. Toho would eventually make Frankenstein Conquers the World in 1965, where he would fight the monster Baragon. Would you ever want to see the Toho Frankenstein battle Godzilla, or are you glad that this movie was scrapped? Several original monsters were designed for the video game Godzilla Unleashed. However, only Obsidious and Crystalac made the final cut after a fan vote. The first scrapped kaiju is Fire Lion, a mythical guardian believed to protect the lost civilization of Mew. The kaiju has tough scales as well as the ability to throw fire from its tail. The Visitor is a feral alien creature captured by the Vortac aliens to unleash upon Earth. It has massive jaws and crab-like appendages that were inspired by Gigan and Orga. The lightning bug was created from a mutated firefly exposed to alien crystal energy. Inspired by Shinji's Eva from Neon Genesis Evangelion, it's a genetically engineered cyborg with hover flight and armor wings for defense. The Godzilla anime trilogy actually has some really fascinating lore that we don't see in the films themselves, but rather in supplemental material. The most interesting piece of backstory is that China created a bioweapon named Hedora to fight off Rodan and Anguirus. Hedora would end up winning this fight, but eventually turned its attention to China and would destroy the country. This is such a cool take on the character, and it makes me wish that we would have actually seen this in the series. In 1990, Godzilla almost had his own ride at Disney World. Let me explain. The ride would have featured Godzilla receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at an award ceremony celebrating classic movie monsters, with Elvira acting as the host. The attraction aimed to represent the horror genre in a lighthearted manner, drawing inspiration from Epcot's The American Adventure. Despite support from Disney executives, concerns over budget led to its cancellation. This concept would eventually be reworked into the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, which opened in 1994. In 1992, Toho planned to bring back Mechagodzilla after the success of Godzilla vs. Mothra. Originally, they planned for a story where a metallic alien named Berserk would come to Earth and turn into Mechagodzilla by assimilating machinery, sort of like Tetsuo the Iron Man. This would eventually be reworked into a story where the Japanese military creates Mechagodzilla, a robot that could split in half with the torso and head becoming a jet while the legs and tail became a tank. This idea of transformation was later used for Super Mechagodzilla and Magura in Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla. And a toy was even made of this concept. Did you know that Toho almost made a movie called Bride of Godzilla? It would have been a sequel to Godzilla Raids Again, and the plot followed Dr. Shida as he creates a giant humanoid robot that resembled his foster daughter. The story unfolds with the discovery that kaijus live in hollow earth. Various monsters appear in the film like a giant chameleon and giant blood-sucking leeches. Everything culminates in a battle between Godzilla and the Bride of Godzilla, the giant robot. And the film would have ended with Godzilla falling in love with the robot, but in a shocking twist, the Bride detonates a hydrogen bomb that was planted in her chest, which destroys both herself and Godzilla. So what do you think? Would you have wanted to see this movie, or are you kind of glad it wasn't made? The Return of King Ghidorah was supposed to be a sequel to Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, and was set for release in 1992. The plot would have involved a new King Ghidorah arriving from space and attacking Earth, which was a nod to its Showa film origins. 
But Toho changed their minds and made Godzilla vs. Mothra instead. Later, when they were planning Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, they toyed with the idea of having an evil alien King Ghidorah named Emperor Ghidorah fight Godzilla. Godzilla vs. Chaos was an early concept for the seventh and final Heisei Godzilla film. It would have been a three-way battle between Godzilla, Godzilla Jr., and the extra-dimensional monster named Chaos. They would have all been fighting over the bioenergy of Ghost Godzilla. However, the concept was abandoned during development, as director Takao Okawara decided to drop the idea of featuring Ghost Godzilla, citing Godzilla's previous battles with duplicates of himself in the preceding films like Biollante, Mechagodzilla, and Space Godzilla. The film would eventually be reworked into Godzilla vs. Destroya. After the lukewarm box office reception of 1989's Godzilla vs. Biollante, Toho aimed to maximize profits with their next Godzilla movie by remaking King Kong vs. Godzilla. The plot allegedly involved King Kong developing romantic feelings for a human scientist, who would subsequently transform him into a cyborg in order to fight Godzilla. However, rights issues caused the film to be scrapped, with the cyborg idea later being reused in 1991's Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. Godzilla vs. The Devil was a proposed late 1970s Godzilla film by Toho. Initially reported in magazines like Japanese Giants and later Fangoria, it was projected for release in 1979, but the film never materialized. Despite continued mentions in publications like Famous Monsters of Filmland, Toho's Tomoyuki Tanaka denied its existence, but that still hasn't stopped Godzilla fans from speculating on what might have been. The Mecha Godzilla that was featured in Godzilla vs. Kong draws heavy inspiration from its diverse lineage across the history of the franchise. In the Showa era, it embodied pure evil, crafted specifically to exterminate Godzilla. During the Heisei period, it arose from the remnants of King Ghidorah, and in the Millennium series, its design was infused with the essence of a deceased kaiju, leading to its uncontrollable rampage. Specifically, it was built around the bones of the original 1954 Godzilla. The legendary Mechagodzilla kind of shares all of these elements. You have the fact that it's evil, the fact that it is a descendant of sorts from King Ghidorah, even though in Heisei it was Mecha King Ghidorah, and of course for Millennium it utilized a deceased kaiju to either power it or allow it to function. Hideki Matsui is a former Japanese baseball player that excelled both in the Nippon Professional Baseball League and Major League Baseball. He was given the nickname Godzilla, which originated from a skin condition that he had earlier in his career, but it evolved to symbolize his formidable hitting prowess. Matsui would go on to make a cameo appearance in the 2002 film Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. He he spent his first 10 seasons with the Giants in the Nippon League before transitioning to the MLB, where he played for the New York Yankees, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, Oakland Athletics, and the Tampa Bay Rays. Matsui would retire with the Yankees on a one-day contract in 2013. In Godzilla Tokyo SOS, Anguirus was originally slated to wash up on shore, but was replaced with Kamobas. This was because Toho was worried about fan outrage. Anguirus was such a beloved character that they were worried that fans would be extremely upset with seeing him killed without any screen time. Hedorah had a lot more screen time in Godzilla Final Wars, but most of the scenes were scrapped. Some of these deleted scenes can actually be spotted during the end credits montage. However, they haven't been released individually, so as a result, they're considered to be lost media. There was a canceled sequel to Godzilla 1998, and it would have started right where the last film left off. Manhattan lies in ruins, and scientists are dissecting Godzilla's body. Tortured by guilt, Nick sneaks into the Manhattan underground, hoping to find a remnant of Godzilla's species. He discovers a dying baby Godzilla trapped under the rubble. After freeing it, he buys a lot of fish to feed it, and then they develop a bond, and the baby Godzilla starts to see Nick as its mother. It imprints on him. When soldiers approach, Nick realizes that they'll kill the baby Godzilla on sight, so he lures it away with fish, and they escape to the waterfront. A homeless man mistakes the baby Godzilla for a pet, and is scared away 
when it snaps at him. Nick tries to convince the baby Zilla to swim off on its own, resorting to tough love when it refuses. He swears at it, he throws rocks at it, and heartbroken, the baby Zilla finally swims away, leaving Nick with mixed emotions. Two years later, strange and eerie occurrences start happening worldwide. A cruise ship found deserted off Australia. A vanished village in Fiji and a jumbo jet mysteriously sliced in half midair over Indonesia with no sign of passengers anywhere. In a small New England town, a giant egg is discovered, sparking concerns of Godzilla's return. General Hicks, suspecting Godzilla's involvement, seeks out Nick. When he and Felipe head to the Australian outback, they encounter Anna Charlton, a tough biologist who's studying dingoes. She initially rebuffs their inquiries. Suspicious of Anna, Felipe secretly tracks her movements. As they trail Anna deeper into the outback, their vehicle breaks down, leaving them stranded. Suddenly, they hear Godzilla's unmistakable roar and witness its full-grown form alongside a group of teen Zillas, its offspring. When the teen Zillas come under attack from dingoes, Nick and Felipe find themselves in danger of being trampled by a stampede. Anna rescues them in her jeep, and they navigate skillfully through the chaos. During their escape, Anna admits to witnessing unusual events, confirming Nick and Felipe's suspicions. Now, in a place of relative safety, Nick and Felipe clash over Godzilla's nature and their responsibilities, as Anna reveals her deep involvement with the creature. Nick's past secret of rescuing the baby Godzilla comes to light, leading to a confrontation where Nick drives straight towards Godzilla to prove its gentleness. And it doesn't attack which leads to them studying Godzilla and its offspring. They discover clues pointing to a different threat. There's a mutated group of insectoids on Monster Island. Realizing Godzilla's role is actually maintaining balance, they attempt to lead Godzilla back to Monster Island, but face a devastating attack from the Global Task Force, which results in the deaths of all but one Godzilla offspring. Despite their efforts, Godzilla and its last surviving offspring, dubbed the Runt, burrow underground for safety. Meanwhile, in Sydney, Australia, a massive greenhouse enclosure houses the mysterious larval egg surrounded by military protection. Nick realizes the egg's significance as the first step in unleashing deadly insectoids worldwide. As General Hicks hesitates to destroy the egg, the queen bitch attacks, prompting Godzilla's dramatic entrance. In a fierce battle, Godzilla fights the queen and manages to destroy her egg. A rescue mission then happens, where a bunch of airborne insectoids attack this airplane and then it crash lands. And amidst the chaos, Nick and Felipe locate and liberate captive humans who were actually taken hostage by the insectoids. These were the natural disasters at the start of the film, like the jumbo jet being sliced in half. The humans weren't actually killed, but were rather taken so they could be used as food to feed the offspring of the queen bitch. They confront the queen again, and Godzilla yet again intervenes, culminating in a decisive victory for the giant reptile. General Hicks, who was once poised to destroy Godzilla, recognizes the creature's inherent value as the people rally around it. A reunion occurs as Godzilla is joined by the Runt, and the two Godzillas head off into the ocean as the humans bid farewell to the monsters. Cut to credits. What's the backstory here? Well, Sony aimed to create a Godzilla trilogy after acquiring the franchise rights in 1992. Of course, they would bring on Roland Emmerich to direct the 1998 film, and despite its profitability, it did gross over three times its budget, the film still fell short of expectations and faced heavy criticism. Tristar still pursued the trilogy idea and started pre-production on a sequel, but it was abandoned in 1999. While this is still a first draft, I think this could have been a fantastic movie. Based on the plot synopsis, this feels more like a Godzilla movie than the 1998 film did. It reminds me of the Showa era flicks. For example, the insect egg washing up on shore is ripped right out of 1964's Mod Mothra vs. Godzilla. I also really like the idea of the horde of Godzilla offspring fighting dingoes. The most interesting part of this movie, though, is the film's antagonist, the Queen Bitch. The name is kind of cringe and doesn't really feel Godzilla-esque, but it's at least more memorable than some of the original Monster vs. Titans that have generic names like Behemoth and Leviathan. While we don't have any art of what she might have looked like, I'm just imagining this mix of, like, a Cazador from Fallout New Vegas and the unused lightning bug monster from the video game Godzilla Unleashed. 
This film also retroactively helps the 1998 Godzilla movie in a few ways. For starters, it totally makes sense now as to why the military caused more damage than Godzilla did. After all, that was one of the biggest complaints people had. Why wasn't Godzilla destroying more buildings? Well, it's because the species is actually peaceful. It only attacks when provoked. Overall, I think this could have been a really neat follow-up to the original film that would have improved it tenfold, much like how the animated series eventually did. You may have noticed, actually, that a few of the plot elements here would be reused for the animated series. I'll make a big video about that cartoon someday, but for now, let's just stay focused and talk about what happened after the cancellation of Godzilla 2. Well, TriStar opted to theatrically release Toho's Godzilla 2000 in the US after scrapping plans for a sequel to Emmerich's remake. TriStar very briefly considered making a lower budget American sequel to Godzilla 2000. It would have been called Godzilla Reborn. The film would have used suitmation on a very small budget. The plot included a female TV reporter and a male hotel owner with Bruce Campbell in talks to Star, which would have just been awesome because Bruce Campbell is great in everything he's in. I think Godzilla Reborn could have been either really good or really bad. I know, brave statements only on this channel. As much as I love seeing actors in practical suits destroying miniature cities, America just doesn't really do soupmation like Japan does. Off the top of my head, I can really only think of the Dino De Laurentiis King Kong movie from 1976 and its sequel, King Kong Lives. I just can't imagine American studio heads taking the project seriously. And that was true when the head of production at Columbia Pictures basically stalled the project, which was one of the many reasons as to why it never even got made in the first place. Toho would end up producing Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah giant monsters all out attack instead. And Sony contemplated making a brand new reboot of the Godzilla franchise that would have been completely unrelated to the 1998 film. but they ended up just letting the rights expire in 2003. On one hand, I'm really sad that Godzilla Reborn was never made just because of how much potential it had, but I'm also somewhat grateful because it means that we got GMK instead, which is hands down the best film of the millennium era. Is either Godzilla 2 or Godzilla Reborn a project that you wish would have seen the light of day, or are you glad that it was scrapped? Let me know down below in the comments. Patrick Totopoulos, the mastermind behind the 1998 Godzilla design, expressed pride in seeing his creation featured in Godzilla Final Wars. He said that he loved seeing his design alongside the Japanese Godzilla. In a noticeable departure from tradition, Keith Emerson of the prog rock band Emerson Lake and Palmer composed the music to Godzilla Final Wars, making it one of the rare instances that a non-Japanese artist scored a Godzilla film for Toho. A very interesting moment occurs in Godzilla Final Wars when a child is playing with a bunch of Godzilla toys. At one point, he grabs a turtle monster toy, says, you loser, and then throws it into the fireplace. This is a subtle jab at Gamera. One of the titans in Godzilla King of the Monsters, Leviathan, lives in Lake Loch Ness. This implies that it's actually the... Ex this implies that it's the same legendary Loch Ness monster, which is a cryptid that supposedly lives in Lake Loch Ness. Guillermo del Toro, who is known for Pan's Labyrinth, the Hellboy movies, and Pacific Rim, almost directed Godzilla 2014, but he had to pull out of the project due to him working on Pacific Rim around the same time. A scrapped 1979 Godzilla movie titled A Space Godzilla would have had a pregnant Godzilla wash up on the shores of Japan with severe diabetes. Godzilla was then revealed to be an alien from Godzilla Planet. The monster then turns into a rocket and flies into space. From there, it gets somehow even crazier where we see a bunch of Godzilla-like aliens battle a different species of aliens on their home planet. There was a scrapped 40 minute long movie titled Godzilla 3D to the Max that would have featured Godzilla fighting a monster called Deathla in Las Vegas. The film would have been released in 2008 with Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster director Yoshimitsu Bano at the helm. Ultimately, this project would slowly morph into Godzilla 2014, which is part of the reason as to why Yoshimitsu Bano is credited as an executive producer. 
In 2002, Katakawa approached Toho in hopes of making a Godzilla and Gamera crossover film. Toho, however, declined the offer and the film was never made. For Godzilla x Kong The New Empire, the blueprint for the Beast Glove is actually based on the arm of Gypsy Danger, the Jaeger from the 2013 film Pacific Rim. In Godzilla x Kong The New Empire, Godzilla appears on screen for only 8 minutes marking the shortest screen time for the monster in a MonsterVerse film at the time of release. This is notably shorter than Godzilla vs. Kong, which featured Godzilla for only 11 minutes, and also shorter than Godzilla King of the Monsters and Godzilla 2014, both of which showcased Godzilla for 10 minutes each. City Shrouded in Shadow is a unique action-adventure survival video game by Granzella and published by Bandai Namco Entertainment. Released for the PlayStation 4 in Japan on October 19th, 2017, the game stands out for its very unusual premise where players navigate a city under siege by famous giant monsters and robots from various Japanese franchises like Godzilla, Gamera, Ultraman, and Neon Genesis Evangelion. The concept for the game originated from Kazuma Kujo, the founder of Granzella, who was known for his work on the Disaster Report series. Granzella aimed to create games that offered novel experiences. The idea of a game featuring ordinary people surviving in a city being destroyed by iconic giant monsters was innovative and ambitious, blending survival adventure elements with pop culture icons. If we're being honest here, it hadn't really been done up until that point, unless you count those garbage Godzilla iOS apps from 2014. The game begins with the player character and their companion who are ordinary civilians, caught up in a catastrophic event where the city is attacked by giant creatures. As they try to survive and escape the city, they encounter various iconic monsters and robots, each presenting a new threat. Each level is centered around one kaiju set piece. So, for example, it's going to be Godzilla fighting King Ghidorah, or Gamera fighting Gaios. You're not going to get Godzilla fighting Gamera, unfortunately. So what's the story? Well, the game begins with the protagonist meeting Yuki when the city is suddenly attacked by alien Zareb, disguised as Ultraman. Players navigate the destruction and meet journalist Otsuka after escaping two Yakuza members. While escaping a wrecked subway train, the protagonists encounter Legion creatures. They receive help from Otsuka's assistant, Riza, and escape the city by car as Gamera arrives to fight off the Legion. As they try to cross a bridge, the same two Yakuza members pursue the protagonist but are stopped by a battle between Mothra and Batra. With help from Detective Fujiwara, inside a building the protagonists are yet again pursued by the two Yakuza members but are distracted by Otsuka. Yuki is briefly held hostage by terrorists who are piloting a growl bear labor but is released once they find what they need. The player and Yuki then encounter Miho Yamamura, who mistakes Yuki for her deceased sister, before being saved by Pyro Busters and an AV-98 Ingram from the Pat Labor series. A battle between the fourth angel and a berserk Evangelion Unit 1 unfolds. The protagonists help Miho reach a hospital to reunite with her father. The protagonists then find themselves on a research ship investigating large marine life. The ship is destroyed by Godzilla, and the protagonist and Yuki barely escape with their lives. Back on land, the protagonists evade two Yakuza members, who pursue them to a warehouse. A battle between rogue J-9 Griffin Labor and police and military mechas ensues. They escape using a fallen Abram Labor and reunite with Riza, who sends them on a mission. The city is ravaged by a battle between Godzilla and King Ghidorah. The protagonists retrieve a package and attempt to escape by train, which is interrupted by a Kirioloid and are saved by Ultraman Tiga. The two Yakuza members that have still been chasing them through all of this chaos and destruction are thwarted by Gaios. Depending on player choice, Yuki may be rescued or escape on her own, with Gamera making a timely appearance. At the National Cosmic Ray Research Laboratory, the protagonists deliver the package but must evacuate when Dada attacks, intending to shrink and collect humans as specimens. They meet Riza at a show interrupted by a battle between Shamshell and Unit 1. The two Yakuza members kidnap Yuki, testing if the monsters are attracted to them. Godzilla appears, leading to a fight with Kiryu, who goes berserk. The protagonists navigate a sewer as the city is rampaged by Ultraman Belial and the Ultraman heroes. They are invited to a building by Detective Fujiwara, only to face more Yakuza threats. 
The eighth angel descends and a battle ensues. Yuki is taken by the Yakuza, but the player, with Fujiwara's help, distracts the thugs. Riza reveals her true allegiance and attempts to exploit the player's powers, but is stopped by Ultra 7. In the end, Yuki is revealed to be an alien, disappears and leaves the player with newfound abilities and a sense of extraordinary events that they survived. Riza faces justice, and the journalist Atsuka profits from all these stories. The player ends on a reflective note, enjoying a meal and pondering the events that they have just endured. So it's safe to say that the story is like just complete nonsense. <laughs> it's very much just taking two action figures and just slamming them together to tell a story. Like, it's just insane. Talking strictly gameplay now, players take on the roles of various characters who must navigate the city, avoid hazards, and make critical decisions to ensure their safety and the safety of their companions. Unlike traditional kaiju games where players would control the monsters, this game flips the perspective, emphasizing human vulnerability and the desperate struggle to survive against overwhelming odds. The game utilizes a third-person perspective, and the player's choices throughout the narrative kind of impact the story, but not really. Like, you're going to kind of get the same ending regardless. Upon its release, City Shrouded in Shadow received mixed to positive reviews. Critics praised the game's unique concepts and the thrill of surviving kaiju attacks, as well as the nostalgia of seeing beloved characters in a new light. However, some pointed out the technical issues like frame rate drops and very, very repetitive gameplay. On top of that, the game was never released outside of Japan. So the gameplay itself is very reliant on reading for puzzles. So if you can't read Japanese, then you're pretty much out of luck. Despite this though, the game has garnered a very niche but dedicated fan base and is considered to be a cult hit. Ultimately, I'm not a fan. It may sound crazy to not like a game that features Godzilla, Gamera, and Ultraman, but hear me out. The game is just not a fun experience. Like I said, it's not in English, so it's borderline unplayable for someone like me that doesn't fluently speak Japanese. Not to mention, I had to rely on external sources to figure out what the actual plot was, and even then, it's borderline nonsensical. The premise is really awesome. I love the idea of playing as a human and trying to survive a kaiju attack. I could see this idea working in a Dead by Daylight format, where a group of players are human and one is a kaiju, and if you want to keep it as a single player game, maybe make it like the Telltale Walking Dead games where it's character driven and your choices actually matter beyond just a few choices that really don't matter, but the game treats it like you do. It's just a ton of missed potential given how massive of a crossover this truly is. I see a lot of people complaining that this game wasn't a fighting game, but I like having more diverse genres in kaiju gaming. A kaiju game doesn't have to just be, you know, destroy all monsters melee. You can do more with the format. Even then, we already have a really good crossover fighting game that's available to the public on modern consoles, and it's called Gigabash. I'm going to be making a video on that game soon, especially now that King Ghidorah and the Smog Monster are being added as DLC. We already have Godzilla monsters, we have Ultraman monsters, and we have their original monsters in the roster. It's pretty jam-packed, so check that game out. If you can find a copy, check out City Shrouded in Shadow. Uh, you could play it regardless of region, so just because it's a Japanese game doesn't mean that you need a Japanese PS4. And PlayStation 4s play any games, so if you get your hands on a copy, I don't know, give it a try. If you're a Godzilla fan and you've seen Shin Ultraman, then you might notice how this version of Gomez is basically just Shin Godzilla, and that's entirely intentional. Eiji Tsuburaya, the creator of both Ultra Q and Ultraman, was also the special effects director on countless Godzilla films. He maintained a great relationship with Toho over the years, and when he launched Ultra Q, they let Tsuburaya use as many old Godzilla suits as he wanted. The Godzilla suit from Mothra vs. Godzilla and Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster would eventually be modified to be used for Gomez in Ultra Q. Hideki Anno, the director of Shin Ultraman, decided to pay tribute to this practice by modifying the 3D model of Shin Godzilla's fourth form. Even the cinematography in this shot looks identical to certain shots that are present in Shin Godzilla. The original Godzilla suit from 1954 was made out of a combination of fiberglass and ready-mix concrete. The suit also included a mechanism that allowed the performer to control the movements of Godzilla's head and tail, adding to the realism of the creature's movements on screen. In addition to the suit, the filmmakers would eventually utilize frame by... 
In addition to the suit, in addition to the suit, the filmmakers would eventually utilize frame-by-frame -frame animation to showcase Godzilla's atomic breath. For some of the close-up shots, the filmmakers utilized a puppet that consisted of Godzilla's upper body. The same goes for any shots of Godzilla's feet, where a partial suit was used that was essentially the main suit, but only from the waist down. This suitmation technique allowed the filmmakers to create a believable and terrifying depiction of Godzilla on screen, making it a key aspect of the film's visual effects and overall impact. Out of the big five, Godzilla, Mechagodzilla, King Ghidorah, Mothra, and Rodan, not all of these monsters have fought each other. For example, Godzilla has battled all of the big five except for Rodan. Sure, there was a small fight scene in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, but beyond that it wasn't really a battle battle. Rodan fought King Ghidorah in Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, he fought Mothra in Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Mechagodzilla in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2. But that being said, no other monster has fought all five. Mechagodzilla and King Ghidorah have never fought each other except for a brief appearance of Ghidorah's skull in Godzilla vs. Kong. Godzilla has made cameos in movies and TV shows like Ready Player One, My Hero Academia, South Park, The Simpsons, and Family Guy. In 1992, a Godzilla suit that was worth $39,000 was stolen from a Toho garage. Later, it mysteriously turned up on the shores of Lake Okutama, near Tokyo, where it frightened a woman who happened to be taking a walk at that time. I just can't imagine walking along a beach and then just seeing a Godzilla suit wash up on shore, likely all decayed and degraded from all the salt water. Stop motion animation was considered for the 1954 Godzilla movie, but it was ultimately rejected due to time constraints. Eiji Tsuburaya, the special effects director on the film, preferred stop motion animation over suitmation, but unfortunately, there just weren't any stop motion animators that were in Japan that were experienced enough. Additionally, Toho's tight production schedule didn't allow for the necessary time needed to animate. Subaraya then innovated suitmation instead, making the production more feasible, albeit challenging. This method effectively portrayed Godzilla's massive size, a feat that would have been difficult with stop motion due to the need for smaller miniatures. However, stop motion animation was still utilized sparingly for certain scenes, such as a vehicle crash and Godzilla's tail movements. Upon its initial release in Japan, Gojira received mixed reviews from critics. Director Ishiro Honda recalled that some audiences found the film to be too weird, and its sequel, Godzilla Raids Again, actually received better reviews. And despite these mixed reviews, Gojira was still a huge box office hit. Kind of ironic, because Gojira is now a certified classic, while Godzilla Raids Again is viewed by fans as one of the worst in the series. In one of the earlier drafts of the original 1954 Godzilla film, Dr. Yamane was going to be a much darker character that bordered on being a villain of sorts. There was going to be a scene of Yamane sneaking into the control room of the electrical towers to sabotage the attempt to kill Godzilla by electrocuting him. Famous horror director John Carpenter, who is well known for making movies like The Thing, Halloween, and They Live, talked a decent amount about his love for the first Godzilla movie, saying, quote, I first saw Godzilla in 1956 at the tender age of eight. Something about the film filled me with a somber dread. Not the monster destroying Tokyo, but the overall tone, an underlying sadness, a sense of grief and horror. Japan is the only nation to suffer atomic bombs dropped on two of its cities, and Godzilla gave powerful expression to this emotional ambiance disguised as a giant monster movie. James Rolfe, the angry video game nerd, almost appeared in Godzilla vs. Kong. Adam Wingard, the director of the film, offered him a cameo, but Rolfe declined because of the birth of his daughter that was coming up and it was way too close to the filming date. Odo Island, the fictional island from the first Godzilla film, makes a very brief appearance at the start of Godzilla Minus One. Godzilla's new design in Godzilla x Kong has purple and pink colored plates, which is very, very similar to his design from Godzilla 2000 and Godzilla vs. Megaguirus. Star Trek actor George Takai made his film debut in the American dub of Godzilla Raids Again. The early form of Destroya was inspired by the Xenomorphs from Alien. The inspiration takes 
an even bigger step further in the scene where the police are picked off one by one in the lab. They even have a little tiny inner mouth, just like what the xenomorphs have. Ghidorah's appearance in Godzilla Planet Eater took very heavy inspiration from the works of H.P. Lovecraft, who is known for his cosmic horror stories. If you know Cthulhu, then well, you know H.P. Lovecraft. The Godzilla anime trilogy features hardly any kaiju battles, and this is something that fans have ripped on for years, but Toho actually demanded this. They stepped in and told the filmmakers that they were supposed to focus more on human drama rather than giant monster battles. The necklace that Gia wears in Godzilla vs. Kong is made of skull crawler teeth. Godzilla Minus One only had 35 VFX artists working on the film. For comparison, 14,000 VFX artists worked on Avengers Endgame. Titanosaurus is not considered to be a kaiju by the screenwriter of Terror of Mechagodzilla. He is instead labeled as a dinosaur in order to highlight his innocence and the fact that he only causes destruction because of mind control. For the West German release of Godzilla vs. Megalon, Jet Jaguar is called King Kong in the dub. Michael Doherty, the director of Godzilla King of the Monsters, has said numerous times that his favorite original titan from the film is Behemoth. The Mecha King Ghidorah suit was actually so heavy that an actor couldn't even wear it. Instead, it was held up by wires, with the heads being puppeteered. Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah was extremely controversial in America upon its release. Many were upset by the supposed anti-American and pro-Japanese messages during the World War II scenes. Tim Burton visited the set of Godzilla vs. Mothra the Battle for Earth while on vacation in Japan. Baby Godzilla from Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 was featured in an advertisement for Canon photocopiers in Japan. Rodan, Anguirus, and King Caesar are the only monsters not killed by Godzilla in the film Godzilla Final Wars. This is a little nod and homage to the fact that they were his allies in the Showa era films. Despite being grouped in with the alien faction in the video game Godzilla Unleashed, Megalon is actually from Earth. He lives underground with the Cetopians. So why would he be labeled as an alien? Well, this is likely because he's allied with aliens in his only film appearance. But despite that, he isn't technically an alien. This is a bit of a misconception that a lot of Godzilla fans just kind of run with. But no, Megalon is not an alien. A very early draft of Destroy All Monsters included Gyra from War of the Gargantuas. For some really weird reason, Frankenstein's name appears in the German titles of other kaiju films like Ghidorah the Three-Headed Monster, Gamera vs. Gaios, King Kong Escapes, Son of Godzilla, and no one's really sure why. Some have speculated that this is a marketing tactic to try to trick German theater goers into thinking that King Kong is in the movie, but it's just kind of a weird relic from that time period. Toho initially planned to release Godzilla vs. Destroya as Godzilla vs. Destroyer in America, but the problem was they couldn't trademark or copyright an everyday word like Destroyer. So having that name for Destroya would have been a really big problem. So they named it Desotroya. Despite this, a lot of video games still call Desotroya Destroya. It's kind of weird, and if I'm being honest, I just call it Destroya because it sounds better than Desotroya. So you get three names Destroya, Destroyer, or Desotroya. After filming on Godzilla vs. Biollante was wrapped, the Biollante suit was placed in storage, which for Toho was just their backlot out in the open. As a result, the suit became a home of sorts to a bunch of stray cats that lived on the Toho lot. This sounds kind of crazy, but you have to remember that it took over 20 crew members to manipulate Biollante and to actually puppeteer the monster. Despite the fact that Godzilla movies are typically not accurate to science, because let's be honest here, a giant monster destroying a city isn't exactly something that can happen in the real world. Godzilla 1985 was one of the very first sci-fi movies to actually reference the theory that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Yeah, it's crazy, but it's true. 
And that's not really a theory anymore. That's just the consensus of the scientific community. But at the time, it was a theory. And that kind of makes that film age pretty well. Despite being a movie that was made for children, Godzilla vs. Gigan from 1972 is the very first film where Godzilla visibly bleeds on screen. Even Anguirus, when he runs headfirst into Gigan's buzzsaw and bleeds all over the camera. Yeah, that was a kid's movie. Anguirus actually appeared in Godzilla King of the Monsters. You might have missed it, but for a very brief moment, you can see his skeleton in Godzilla's underwater temple just as the nuke goes off. According to Hideki Anno, who was the director of Shin Godzilla, Toho was very very reluctant to give Godzilla multiple forms. After all, this is something that Godzilla hasn't really done in the past, unless you count Godzilla Saurus in Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah. However, it wasn't until Bandai, the toy company, stepped in and explained to Toho that, hey, if you make multiple versions and forms of Godzilla, that means that you can sell more toys and collectibles. So Toho let Hideki Anno basically do whatever he wanted for that movie, and it paid off. The protagonist of Godzilla Minus One, Koichi, was named after Koichi Kawakita, who was the special effects director on all of the Heisai Godzilla films. After the release of King Kong vs. Godzilla, Toho tried to make Godzilla vs. Batman, with Adam West in the lead role and a supposed cameo by Bruce Lee was supposed to happen. The project ultimately ended up being scrapped after the cancellation of the 1966 Batman TV show as a result of poor ratings. In the 70s, a colorized version of the original 1954 Godzilla film was released in Italy. It was given a new score and was re-edited to feature real footage of World War II. The entire movie is honestly a chaotic mess. It's labeled as Cozilla. The filmmaker behind it, Luigi Cozy, who made films like Star Crash, Contamination, and Paganini Horror, bought the distribution rights from Toho to distribute the film in Italy. He wanted it to be more up-to-date and modern for the time. So he included a bunch of extra scenes of older movies like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and even Godzilla Raids Again. In 1983, Steve Miner pitched Godzilla King of the Monsters in 3D to Toho. Miner had previously directed Friday the 13th Part 2 and Part 3, while also working on films like The Last House on the Left and the first Friday the 13th movie. Toho approved the pitch, and thus, work began on the very first American Godzilla. Miner hired Fred Decker to write the film's script. Weirdly enough, Decker wasn't actually a Godzilla fan. He described the Showa-era flicks as being cheesy. As a result, the script leaned away from special effects and destruction, instead taking more inspiration from the works of Steven Spielberg, with the goal being to make this action-adventure romp more than your run-of-the-mill kaiju flick. Miner then hired William Stout to design this new version of Godzilla. And if I'm being honest, I kind of dig it. While the head is way too big and too similar to that of a T-Rex, I think it works as a unique take on the character. In my opinion, the best Godzilla design is minus one, but the second best design is the Heisei era Godzilla. And that was like a couple years away at, at this point. So I think it works. You see, the silhouette is there. Godzilla has to have a good silhouette. If you can just show someone this, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's Godzilla. The maple leaf spines are there, which is better than the 2014 design. The posture is perfect. Granted, it is hard to tell how this would have looked on screen as our only point of reference are these promotional pictures with very basic and not so flattering lighting. Looking at the American merchandise and artwork of Godzilla, this is actually pretty close to how your average American in the 1980s would perceive the character. In order to bring Godzilla to life, the filmmakers considered various special effects methods. Miner reached out to prominent figures in the Hollywood special effects industry, inviting many to a special screening of the original 1954 film. Rick Baker was tasked with creating an animatronic Godzilla head for the close-up shots, while Jim Danforth was slated to animate stop motion with David Allen overseeing the animation team. Most importantly though, Miner envisioned the film to be in 3D. Despite keen interest from producers like John Peters and Keith Barish, the projected budget of $30 million 
made studios kind of shy away from it. They deemed it excessive for what they perceived as a children's film. By the end of 1984, faced with studio reluctance and budget constraints, Miner abandoned efforts to move the film into production. Meanwhile, Toho had independently revived the franchise by making Return of Godzilla, marking the first Godzilla film in nine years. Nearly a decade later, in 1992, Toho sold the rights to produce an American Godzilla film to Sony Pictures Entertainment. Screenwriters Terry Rossio and Ted Elliott were enlisted to craft a script for the film, completing it by 1994. The plot follows a hostile alien race capable of engineering a biological weapon intended to obliterate life on Earth, paving the way for alien colonization. This being, this bioweapon, would be known as the Griffin, and it arrives at a lake in Utah encased within a meteorite dispatching probe bats to gather genetic material from Earth's diverse fauna to create a monster. Enter Godzilla, a creature forged by an ancient civilization through blending dinosaur genes to combat this imminent threat. Godzilla embarks on a journey towards the lake to thwart the meteor and probe bats. However, Godzilla's mission is thwarted when Godzilla is tranquilized and captured at the Golden Gate Bridge by the U.S. Navy. With Godzilla neutralized, the probe bats intensify their genetic harvesting, constructing the Griffin's monstrous body. Despite efforts by the human characters to intervene, they arrive too late as the Griffin emerges, fully formed, and it sets course for New York City. In the heart of New York, Godzilla regains consciousness and confronts the Griffin in a climactic showdown. Initially hindered by a lingering tranquilizer tank, Godzilla rallies, breaks free, and turns the tide of the battle. Ultimately, Godzilla emerges victorious, vanquishing the Griffin and safeguarding Earth from impending doom. Quick side note, apparently the movie was supposed to end with the Griffin being decapitated and the head would have been on the Statue of Liberty. Director Jan DeBont, fresh off the success of Speed, took interest in the script and Sony hired him. Stan Winston was then hired to bring Godzilla the Griffin and the probe bats to life through practical effects. Based on what has been released, either through leaks or just the Stan Winston Studios website, I absolutely love these monster designs. Godzilla looks great here. It feels like a big dinosaur, but it's an improved version over the William Stout version from 1983. I love how aggressive the face looks. It feels like it belongs in the Heisei Gamera trilogy just based on aesthetics alone. Even then, I'm not sure if this would have been the final design. There's this one promotional image where the design looks really similar to the main Heisei era Godzilla, but regardless, it's a really solid look. The Griffin looks fantastic too. It blends fantasy and sci-fi with the monster obviously being a nod or a callback to the Griffin from mythology. However, it also has this otherworldly presence to it. I love the hooves and I love its posture. It feels like Toho could realistically make this a man in a suit if they really wanted to put the Griffin in one of their movies. I genuinely wish I could see this monster go toe to toe with Godzilla. Like, I just want to know how they would fight. In the original draft of Godzilla 2014, the titular Big G was found frozen in an iceberg. This is an unintentional or possibly intentional homage to both Godzilla Raids Again and Godzilla Final Wars. However, the scene was removed because it was deemed to be far too similar to a sequence that was in Man of Steel, released in 2013. The skydiving or halo jump scene from Godzilla 2014 was actually done practically. Real skydiving photographers were hired by Legendary to shoot the sequence. In the post-production phase, the scene was edited to include necessary CGI with Godzilla and the Mutos being visible in the sequence. In 2020, Godzilla vs. Kong was delayed as a result of certain world events. Netflix offered Legendary $200 million for the rights to the film, but was ultimately turned down as they instead opted to release the film theatrically the following year. Beyond appearing in Godzilla vs. Space Godzilla, Mogira had previously appeared in the 1957 film The Mysterians. This version of the character is wildly different from its Heisei counterpart. The Showa version of Mogira is more or less just a war machine. It's controlled by the titular Mysterians to help them invade Earth. In fact, there's actually two Mogiras in the movie. It's kind of wild when you consider that the Heisei version was built by humanity in order to protect them, while the Showa version sought to destroy humanity. 
Space Godzilla's roar is actually just a modified version of Gigan's roar. This was done several times throughout the Heisei era. Just look at Batra and Rodan, who share very similar roars. Dave Filoni, the producer behind the animated series Star Wars The Clone Wars, as well as more recent Star Wars projects like Ahsoka and The Mandalorian, has stated that Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla from 1974 is his all-time favorite Godzilla movie. The Mothra larva costume was actually the largest costume that Toho had ever made during the Showa era, specifically the one from the 1961 Mothra solo film that destroys Tokyo was 7 feet tall and over 31 feet long. Eight actors were needed in order to operate it. When Mothra is seen in the water, a three-foot-long prop was made that was propelled by a built-in motorcycle engine. The end credits for 2019's Godzilla King of the Monsters features a lot of really cool things that you might have missed. We get to see some subtle foreshadowing hinting at what the MonsterVerse still has to offer, like a nod towards Mechagodzilla. On top of that, it also features some really neat tributes to the Toho films, and even the 1956 Americanized version of the original Godzilla movie, with a nod towards Raymond Burr's character, Steve Martin. Meanwhile, the music playing in the background is a cover of the Blue Oyster cult song, Godzilla. It's wild to think that this is the very first time that that song has been used in a Godzilla movie, and while I adore the original song, I'm a big fan of this cover. It has System of a Down's Serge Tonkian on vocals alongside members of the band Death Clock, and it is just really, really good. This song was on loop for like weeks. Well, that about wraps everything up. I just want to say thank you so much for watching or listening, depending on whichever one you did. Regardless, I just want to say thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.